Hi, I'm Glenn, and I'm going to talk about programming languages for the Commodore 64. Uh, programming languages are my main interest. Programming languages and operating systems are my main interest on Commodore 64. And there are not a lot of people working in that area, so I'm trying to kind of rectify the situation by giving a series of talks on some of the languages that are available. And I've spoken here before and at World of Commodore up in Toronto. So why would I speak about Promol again? I just talked about it at this show two years ago. How many people heard that talk? Anybody? A couple of people did. And if you heard that talk, you might remember that I was very excited. I was very excited about Promol. In fact, I was like a love-struck teenager. And there's good reason for it, because I had been searching for a full and complete copy of Promol for literally for decades with all the documentation and everything, because it was very frustrating to have this interesting looking language and not be able to use it. However, with any programming language or any development environment, sooner or later you're going to find that it's maybe not quite as perfect as you thought it was, and you know, nothing is. So here's kind of where I'm at now. So what I'd like to do today is talk about some of Promol's shortcomings and how we might get around them. I'm going to talk specifically about disk handling and disk utilities, especially when you're using the bigger devices like a micro IC or a CMD hard drive. How many of you guys have CMD hard drives? Oh, wow, more than I expected. How many have a micro IC? A lot, a lot more hands. Yeah, okay, that's, that's kind of what I expected too. So, the, as I talk about Promol and the utilities I wrote and so forth, there will be as much about the differences, the subtle differences between micro IC and CMD hard drive as there is about Promol. And I'm not going to show any code this year. I've got it at my, at my table, so if you're interested in the code behind this, come on over. It's in a binder. You can page through it. So what are these so-called shortcomings that Promol allegedly has? Okay. First of all, it only supports two drives. Well, that's not so bad. You know, that was pretty common in those days. In fact, if you had a pair of 1541s, you were a power user, right? I mean, that was a big deal if you had two drives. So I'm not that worried about that. It only supports two drives. OK, fine. You put the, the, uh, the uh, runtime and the shell and the compiler and stuff on one drive and put your source code on the other drive, you're fine. OK. The drives have funny names. He refers to them as zero colon and one colon. Now most Commodore users think of that as the unit number, not the drive number. So that's a little weird. But if you look at the Promol manual, it says that it supports both the MSD and I think the older 4040 style drives where that would actually be correct if you had one of those that has two mechanisms in one cabinet. So then it would actually be zero and one. So you know. What's in a name, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So that's, I'm not worried about that either. You know, you can get used to that. That's not a big deal. Ah, this one's a bit of an issue. You can't easily change what zero colon and one colon point to. Out of the box, it's eight and nine. Again, that was pretty common. I mean, you're, you're generally going to have your stuff set up on eight and nine, unless you're a power <laughs> user like me, okay? So I normally have, and you'll see when I start up, that I've got for this demo, I've got a 1541 on 9, CMD hard drive on 12, and a micro IEC on 16. What am I going to do with that? Well, so you softwire the drives, you know. There might be a way around this because the, the memory locations that store the device numbers for 0 colon and 1 colon are documented. And you could load Promol, type in a couple of well-chosen pokes, and then run it. But my goal here is historical accuracy. I want to use Promol exactly as it was written, or at least as much as possible. You have to turn off the fast loader and stuff like that. But I want to use it as much as possible as it was originally distributed. So I softwire my drives before I start, and you'll see that. But again, yeah, this, I can live with all this. This I can get around, you know? But. At a certain point, I keep coming back to this. I've only got two drives, but now 
the other drives I can't even issue housekeeping commands on, like directories or file copies and stuff like that. What I've been doing is I've got a partition on the CMD hard drive with my source code in, and periodically I want to back it up to the floppy. And of course, image the floppy, you know. Well, I couldn't do that when I started this project. I couldn't do that without exiting Promal and using the Jiffy DOS file copier. I don't want to have to do that. That's hard work. Programmers never like hard work, okay? So that's a bit of an issue. And last but not least, the deal breaker. The disk utilities that come with Promal, they're kind of crummy. <laughs> They really are not very good at all. For example, there's a directory lister called files, okay? By default, it only shows you your compiled executables. What, I can't see my source code? I mean, come on. So, and there are other examples I could give too, but I don't want to say bad things about Promo. So what I did was I scratched the itch and I wrote a whole bunch of disk utilities and that's what I'm going to be talking about how I wrote them and my adventures in making them work on various devices. First one I wrote, let's see, yeah, is get CMD date. Now when Promal starts up, he normally asks you for the date with a prompt. And you want to enter that date because the date is embedded in compiler listings. Right. So you want to do that, but you know, eight keystrokes plus hitting return Again, that's a lot of work, you know, that's a lot, my, my fingers are going to break. So if you've got the CMD hard drive, well, why not just pull the time off of there, plug it into the appropriate system variables, and you're done. That's great. Works great. So here's the first incompatibility between CMD hard drive and micro IEC, because I wanted to make this work on all possible devices. If you try it on the 1541, you're going to get a syntax error. Obvious, easy to detect. The docs say that if you don't have a real-time clock in the micro IEC, you'll also get a syntax error. You don't. And you get some kind of date back. I don't know where it's coming from, if it's in the firmware or whatever. It actually has a clock in it. Huh? It actually has a clock in it. Well, yeah, and, and you can set the time and it'll keep ticking, yeah. right? Of course, you lose it when it powers off again. Um, but there's another incompatibility, and it's a Y2K incompatibility. On a CMD hard drive, one byte for the year, 2016 is 16. On a micro IEC, the year field is 116. Okay, I went through Y2K, I know what that was like, and I know there's all kinds of arguments about it, but if it's not the same way as CMD, it's wrong. Sorry, that's my opinion. Anyway, works great, and it also is small and simple enough that it'll run from a batch file. Promal has batch files and it supports an autoexec file which is called bootscript.j. Now, let's see, for the rest of these, they're all a little more complicated. So I wrote a library module called diskutils and it's an API module essentially. So I'll walk through a little bit what each of these APIs does. The first one is just a convenience method, get logical file number. And the reason that's needed is that a couple of these, those bottom two, um, open a file and you don't know what the calling program might already have open. So you can't hard code file numbers into this. So if you know the Commodore 64, there are three 10 byte tables at 259 hex, logical file numbers, device numbers, and secondary addresses. It's easy to inspect those tables and find an unused file number and that's all this does. The rest of these go in pairs so the first one, drive query, is based on some code by Todd Elliott. Who knows who Todd Elliott is? Everybody? Yeah. He's, I don't think he's been active in Commodore scene for years, but he's the guy who wrote the ACE operating system, right? <clears throat> well, he wrote some code to detect a whole bunch of drives, again, with other people's help. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. And I added a little bit to it as well to be able to detect a micro IEC. So what it does is it just queries every possible drive number puts the results in a table with a one byte field indicating the drive type. And then the corresponding one, the one, the, the, uh, the one that goes in the pair here, drive description, you can pass that byte and get back the address of a string describing what it is, like CMD hard drive, 1541, whatever. 
The next two, and these are interesting, we'll see these more about these in a minute, partition description, uh, get partition type and partition description. Get partition type uses the CMD G-P command or get partition info to tell the type of, to get some other information too about either the current partition or any given partition. It takes a byte argument. And then the corresponding one, part desk, which allows you to pass in the partition type and get back the address of a string like CMD native or 1541 emulation. The next two are for sending commands over the command channel and reading the command channel back to get your, hopefully, your 0, OK, 0, 0. This is interesting because when Promol starts up, he opens files on the command channel on both drives, typically 8 and 9. So he does the equivalent of open 15, 8, 15, open 14, 9, 15, and he leaves them open. As long as that Promol runtime is running, you've got two file handles burnt up. That's another reason to have that first API, get LFN. So what do I do if I want to send a command to an arbitrary drive on the bus? Maybe one of Promol's, maybe not. I could say, well, if it's one of Promol's, I'll use the existing open file. Otherwise, I'll open my own file. Uh, that's kind of kludgy. You could, how about if you just close Promol's command channels? Do what you need to do and then reopen them again at the end. You know what the numbers are, right? He won't be any the wiser. Real big problem with a library module doing that because what happens to all other open files when you close the command channel? They also get closed, so really bad idea. So I was whining and moaning about this in IRC and Agent Friday reminded me, everybody knows Agent Friday, right? The Portland guys couldn't come this year, too bad. <clears throat> but he reminded me that you don't have to open a file to send a command over the command channel. If you use the low-level kernel routines, you can just say, for example, device 12 listen, listen on 15, and then you call CI out to send bytes directly over the serial bus without going through all the overhead of care out. <clears throat> and when you're done, you say unlisten. And it's the same thing in reverse. When you want to read the message from the command channel, you say device 12 talk, talk on secondary 15, and then you call acceptor, which accepts bytes right off the serial bus. And when you're done, you say untalk. This is great because it, it not only doesn't disturb any open files, it doesn't even disturb the open files that Promol already has on the command channel. So I could do that to devices that Promol has the command channel open as a file on, and it won't bother them. So this is a great technique if you don't know it. And, and the funny thing is, you know, I say Agent Friday reminded me that this was possible, and I did actually know this already. I had just forgotten it because I read it in Doug Cotton's articles in Commodore World on programming the serial bus using the uh, kernel routines. Do you guys know those articles? That they are absolutely the last word. If you want to do kernel serial bus programming, Commodore World, Doug Cotton's articles. And then the last two, they're kind of related, get dirhead and read sect. Uh, get dirhead gets the directory header for the, for the current disk and or partition slash directory, whatever. And how it works is, how many people know the difference between when you open the directory as a file on a Commodore 64 using a secondary address of zero and a non-zero secondary address? Um, if you use a secondary address of zero and read bytes back from the directory, the operating system formats it as though it were a basic program. And of course, secondary address of zero is what load uses. And this is why at the basic prompt, you can type load $8 and lists because it's formatted as a basic program and the interpreter doesn't know, doesn't know any difference. He looks at it and he goes, hey, looks like a basic program to me. I can list that. And you get a directory listing. Obviously, you shouldn't try and run it, but if you open the directory as a file with a non-zero secondary address, you get the raw bytes right off the surface of the disk, minus the first two bytes of every sector, which is the track and sector pointer, forward pointer. So you get it in chunks of 254 bytes. 
Well, that's what get durhead does because all it does is get you the, those first 254 bytes that has not the directory but the directory header. So you've got the disk name, the BAM, and all the other good stuff that goes with it, about which more in a minute. And then read sec gets you a whole sector. You just pass in the device number, track, and sector, and it'll read a sector for you. And if you specified something illegal, it's on you. So the first of the utilities. Oh, no, the first one is easy. The first one is drives. Now, this uses that drive query routine. And it's so simple. All these programs have a stub loader and a main program. And the main program is actually smaller than the stub loader. That's how simple this program is. Because everything is done in that library module. So it calls drive query. And like I said, that fills a table. And the table is declared export which means the calling programs can inspect the values in that table. So it's a simple matter to call drive query and then iterate through that table. And every time you get a non-zero value, look it up with drive description and say, OK, drive 8 is a micro IC. Drive 9 is a CMD hard drive. And I'll show you that. I don't, oh, I don't have my flyer on. That's one of the things it can't recognize is the, uh, the RAM drive on a flyer. Um, yeah, that, that's all there is to it. Very simple, very simple. This one, though, this is a different story. This one, eventually, I, I started posting about this in a thread on the micro IC mailing list, and the thread went to over 50 messages. That's how complicated this got. What I wanted was, if you're in a native partition on the CMD hard drive, I've always wondered, couldn't you just write a little utility that's like PWD in Unix? Print the working directory. Should be easy, right? And a little bit of inspection in the manual showed that, in fact, it is pretty easy. Because I said there would be more about the directory header, right? In a CMD native partition, the directory header contains a track and sector pointer to the parent directory's header. So it's a simple matter. To get, the, to get the path, the current working directory. You call get durhead. You look at the disk name field, put it at the end of your buffer, put a slash in front. Then you follow that track and sector pointer up one, and you call read sect to read that sector. Again, you grab the disk name field, put it in front, put a slash in front. And when, that, when you get to where that track and sector pointer to the parent directory is zeros, then you know you're at the root. Tack another slash on the front and you're done. So you'll have something like slash slash subder one slash subder two. Works great, fantastic. Now, if you try that at the root of a micro IC in the native partition, the fat partition, it's not going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is when you call get durhead, there's no parent directory track and sector pointer. And there really couldn't be, because it's a fat file system. There's nothing meaningful you could put in those two bytes that would allow you to go upwards. So Jim Brain suggested, why not use the cd back arrow command, which is like cd dot dot in Unix. Go up one, right? He says, you could just keep on walking up the directory chain. So that works. You call get durhead, take the disk field, put it at the end, put a slash in the front. Then you go cd back arrow to go up one directory called get durhead again, grab the disk name field, put it in front, put a slash in front. And when cd back arrow returns 62 file not found, you know you're at the root. You put another slash on the front, voila, you've got your, you've got your current working directory. There's only one problem. By this time, you have changed directory several times, and you're no longer where you started. But not to worry. You put a CD on the front of that, execute it as a command, and you're back where you started. Works great. Perfect. So now, good thing we have that drive query routine, because to make it easy, you might say to yourself, OK, we'll just use that technique everywhere, right? And use it on both micro IC and CMD hard drive to make it simpler. Of course, it's not going to be this simple. The CD back arrow technique doesn't work on a CMD hard drive. And the reason it doesn't is that when you're at the root directory and you issue CD back arrow, 
it does not return a 62 file not found. It returns 0, OK, 0, 0, and leaves you at the root directory. So if you try that technique on a CMD hard drive, you're going to enter an endless loop trying to go up over and over and over again and waiting for an error message that's never going to come. So you can't use that technique on a CMD hard drive, and you can't use the parent directory pointer technique on a micro IEC. So you have to know which kind of device you're on. But wait, there's more. What if you're on the micro IEC and you're in a CMD native partition image, a DNP image? Everybody knows what a DNP image is? You know you have your D64 image that's a file image of a, of a 1541 disk. There are also DNP images, which is a raw image, typically 16 meg, of a CMD native partition. So if you're on the micro IC and you're inside a CMD native partition and you try this technique, it'll work. The parent directory pointers are there. Now, how do you tell that you're inside a disk image? Turns out it's that g-p command that get partition info, the get partition info, info API uses. So for example, if you're inside a D64 on the micro IC and you call g-p, Micro IC is going to tell you that you are in a CMD 1541 emulation partition. That's okay. That's useful. That's how you tell that you're inside a D64 image on a micro IC. If you're inside a DNP CMD native partition image, it's going to tell you CMD native partition. However, if you're at the root of the micro IC in the FAT file system where it won't work, where the parent directory technique won't work, and you call g-p, he's also going to tell you CMD native partition, so you just can't win. And Jim said he's actually considering some changes in the firmware to make this more compatible. But this, this was my adventure writing this, so a, a lot was learned, uh, including, of course, how to tell whether you're in a disk image. It does not support 1581 native subdirectories. How many people have ever used those? Nobody even knows what they are, I bet. They're actually more like partitions. And the less said about them, the better. Now, the rest of these are actually useful. I mean, that utility, PWD, I mean, that was really an ivory tower exercise, right? I mean, it's nice to have. You just you know what directory you're in, but how useful is it really? The rest of these are everyday useful utilities. And the next one is LS, list directory. So. I started writing this actually in PowerC. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. This talk was originally going to be about PowerC. I don't know what it is with me in PowerC. Either I'm not a very good C programmer, or I don't understand the difference between K and RC and ANSI C. I, I don't know what it is, but I never seem to get very far with PowerC. Anyways, I was writing this utility in PowerC. And in C, something like this is easy, because you just declare a structure representing the directory entry, right? And then as you're reading the directory on disk, every time you come to another directory entry, you say malloc size of struct durant. Hey, great. So now I'm writing this in Promal. Uh, let's see, Promal has no struct. Promal has no malloc. Ah, I guess we'll have to do it the old fashioned way, all right? So what I did is Promal, allow, Promal gives you a pointer to the first unused byte of memory beyond the end of your program. So you know where that is, and you know where you can start using memory. <coughs> and instead of creating a structure, which you can't do in Promol, you can't even do it by declaring a bunch of variables in order, because the scalars and the arrays won't be in the same place. But what I did was, I just used the raw bytes, and then I declared a bunch of constants that were offsets into the directory entry for the various fields. So for example, for the size field, there's a constant named D size or, dire or directory size is the file size. So as I'm stacking these all up in memory, I'm maintaining a pointer called nexter. Say nexter, read 32 bytes, tack them on, bump it up 32 bytes, read another directory entry, copy them in, bump them up. And the reason I'm holding them all in memory is because I want to be able to sort them, or at least sort pointers to them. So what you do is, in Promol, there's this great thing with pointers where you can dereference a pointer as any variable type. It's sort of like 
it's sort of like or, or it's sort of like casting a void pointer in C, right? So what I say is, when I want to show the size, the file size, I say in parentheses nextdir plus d size. So that's the memory pointer to that size. At sign plus, which means dereference that variable as a, dereference that as a word variable. In other words, he takes the two bytes, and you don't have to say you know like you do in basic. High byte times 256 plus low byte. You know, Promo does it all for you. And you can dereference any kind of variable that way. Word, byte, even floating point, sign variables, all that kind of stuff. So it turns out that this is not all that hard in Promal because even though you're doing it low level, he provides you with a lot of help. <coughs> and I gave it all the bells and whistles as long as I was at it. Let's you specify a drive number. It has for really real wild cards, not cheap wild cards like Commodore wild cards. What happens if you want to see files that are star.s? In Unix, you did a directory of that. You know you get everything ending in .s. What happens if you, if you in Jiffy DOS, for example, if you type at sign dollar colon star dot s, what do you get? You get everything because he ignores everything after the asterisk. So I made this work correctly. Unfortunately, that means it's got to walk through every file name and look at them, but that's okay. I also put in sort by name, sort by timestamp on the right kind of machine. And I'm really happy about this. This was the first one I finished, and I was using it constantly as soon as it was done. Well, if you have LS, you have to have CP, right? And by the way, CP uh, or LS, like CP, supports CMD syntax. So I can be who knows where, and I can say, show me the directory of drive 9, partition 27, whatever. We'll see that. And then I wrote CP while I was at it. And this one was actually pretty complicated. It took me like two weeks just to get the, the syntax checking, sanity checking for file names, wildcard matching, all that kind of stuff. When I finally dropped in the actual copy code, it was like a day you know, to get it right. So source and, source and destination directory, CMD syntax, again, for really real wild cards. And you can use dot as a destination which means the current directory on the target drive. And since I'm not completely insane, it only supports program and sequential. Forget about user, relative, deleted, and any of the strange combinations you can create. Oh, and there's one more I didn't even make a slide for. I made one more, and again, it's, it's very simple. It's like that drives command. It's so small, it's like you know, just a few lines of code. And it's called uh, CMD, command. So you say command, drive number, string, and you can say like, you know, I0 or N0 space disk name or whatever, really quick. So bottom line, do I still love Promal? Am I still a love struck teenager? Actually, yeah, because in the course of writing all these utilities to, to correct all the sh so-called shortcomings, I ended up having a ball. This, is, this was just great. Promo has great high-level language features. You know, it's got a couple of different looping constructs, local variables. It's got good low-level language features, like that pointer stuff I talked about. Basically, it's like not too big, not too small, just right. It's the perfect high-level language for this machine. I use high-level language advisedly there. It's got good multi-module support, so you can have, you know, library routines like I wrote. Very sophisticated loader. You can tell it stuff like, hey, go and load this other module and then come back here. Just leave it. Or you can say, hey, go and load this other module, run it, and when it finishes running, unload it and come back here. There's like six or eight different combinations you can use. Great support for assembly. In fact, it's got a JSR keyword that allows you to even set the register values beforehand and query them afterwards. It's got a shell. These are, after all, command line programs. It's got a shell with batch scripts and command line recall. When I start demoing, you'll see the value of that command line recall. Because when I was testing some of this stuff, it would be like, OK, let's see, cp-s9-d12-27 slash slash blah, 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 blah. And it would bomb. You know? And I go, oh, yeah, right. I'd recompile it, 
It'd be all fixed, ready for another test, and I'd go, what did I just type to test that? No problem, command recall saves the day. And of course, you can't argue with 450 pages of documentation. So those are the pros, great language. And what are the cons? Somebody scratched some of those out, look at that. I bet it was my cat. Um, yeah, if you take those out, if you remove those shortcomings, what's left? What's not to like, okay? Well, it doesn't have a linker, really. Um, so you have to manually load other modules. And that library module that I wrote, if I make a change in that, I have to recompile every program that depends on that. Well, you know what? I have news for you. Promol is not the only language that's like that. That's not so bad. I'm going to worry about that. Which leaves the bottom one, and that's really the only one that I have a problem with. Promol aggressively tries to keep programs loaded, up to half a dozen of them at a time. And that works great if you're running a bunch of small programs, like little tiny utilities, unlike the giant kitchen sink ones that I wrote. So if you say, load and run program A, fine, and he leaves it there. Then you say, run program B, fine, and he leaves it there. Then you say, run program A. He's not going to fetch it from disk. He's going to try and rerun the one that's already there. In fact, he's going to check some at first to make sure you haven't stepped on it. That's great, but like I say, if you're working with large programs like the one I just wrote, it acts funny. It should just say, hey, I don't have enough memory to do this. Try again, unload something, do whatever you need to do. But I've seen everything from, well, from nothing, where you type a command, nothing happens, and the command prompt comes back. Okay. All the way up to Promol giving an error message and a register dump. I'm like, well, that's helpful. Okay, type unload. In fact, I started using the unload command so much that I ended up assigning it to an F key. You'll see that in my startup script. So those are the cons. That, that last part is kind of annoying, but other than that, everything can be worked around. Everything can be worked around. So we're staying together, okay? The bottom line, when all is said and done, yeah. This is still, I've spent like 30 years playing around with programming languages on this machine. And this is the best one I found. I'm, I have a ball with it, and I bet you will too if you're a programmer and you want to try working with it. In fact, about the only thing to be said is, Promal rules, okay? Yeah. Promal rules. <coughs> so here's the obligatory resources page. I've got all this stuff on my site. I've, everything you could want for Promal. Disk images, documentation is PDFs. Thanks to our friend. GLH. Oh, no, you didn't do those, did you? Anyways. Yeah, I think you did some of them, yeah. And, uh, oh, you made better ones because they weren't OCR. Wasn't that it? Something like that, whatever. Anyway, there's also a cheat sheet, and I expanded on my cheat sheet now. It's a PDF with uh, common commands and language features and so forth. And I can demo this. I've got everything else with me at my table, too, so if you really want to see COBOL on a Commodore 64, I've got that. And I've also got my collection of operating systems. So now, it's demo time. And I promise I'll clean that typewriter, but not today. So I have a button to push. Oh, I have to push a couple times. Last Promol demo I did, I almost had a fist fight with the disk drive. <coughs> All right, so I should have turned this so I could see it, I guess, since I can't see it over here. But remember one of the things I mentioned on Promol is that you can't easily control what zero colon and one colon stand for. So I always start by soft wiring my drives. And again, I'm starting with micro IEC on 16, CMD hard drive on 12, and 1541 on nine. So I have to jigger them around so that micro IC ends up on eight, CMD hard drive ends up on 12, and everybody's in the right partition in the right directory. So bear with me while I do that. I'm gonna get a sore neck. I really should have turned this around, but I'm gonna do my best here. Do I 16?
And we'll make, oh, that's not going to work. Ah, come on. Okay, now he's device eight. Now the CMD. Now he's nine. Okay, so we should have eight, which is micro IC, nine CMD hard drive, and 12, 1541. Okay. So now we can go back to device eight and fire up Promal and hopefully have a good demo. First thing you'll see, of course, is that the auto exec batch file loads my get CMD date program, goes and asks the CMD drive what time it is, what day it is. Oh, this isn't doing what it's supposed to do, is it? Okay, what happened? Did I just lose the signal or? <coughs> Pardon me? Okay, so it crashed, all right. I've never seen a commenter crash in my life, my God. Huh, okay, I must have bumped something. No, this is eight. This is eight. Okay, I'm not in the right place. Whoops. Oh, I bet that's what happened. Yeah, you made that okay. I should have done a directory to make sure I, I was in the right place. <clears throat> that's more better. Okay. So the first thing you'll see is the get CMD date program runs from the startup script. And it asks the hard drive what day it is. And the hard drive says 9, 10, 16. So there's my auto exec, and you can see about halfway down, get CMD date nine, that's where it gets the, hard, the, uh, the date. And you can also see towards the end that I have F key seven unload, because I use the unload command so much I assigned a, a function key to it. So if I try this on the micro IC, which is currently device eight, I'll get a response. And the code says, by the way, if the year is greater than 100, subtract 100. So I get something back, but I think this is in the firmware or something. It's a, like a default date or something. So it, it works. And the magic of command line recall. If I try it on a 1541, I'll get a syntax error. So the program is just going to whine and bail. No clock. Obviously, no clock on there. So that's that command. Um, drives. The drives command. Now this is interesting because all of these are big enough that they take a noticeable amount of time to load even on a fast device like these. But notice that at one point he'll say enumerating drives or something like that. And that message only appears for a split second. He's walking through all these devices and he finds them really quick. So loading, 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 enumerating. You can see it went away almost instantly. And he's telling us what we've got on the, on the machine. So that's a nice thing to have. I don't know how, how useful it is from the command line. Maybe if you forget how you have your drive soft wired, you know, and you go, what do I have on 12 again? You know, you can use this. But that routine comes in, obviously, much more useful when you have those programs like PWD, where you need to know which kind of device you're on in order to behave a certain way. So, Let's try that command. PWD on 9, which is the CMD hard drive. Drives to see which method to use, parent directory pointer or CD back arrow. And it tells us a whole bunch of information. Drive 9 is, of course, it's calling the drive description routine. Partition, okay, g-p gave us back a bunch of other information, including the current partition's number, the type. It called uh, part desk, part partition description, to get the address of that string cmd native and plug it in. 
and of course the name, Promal. And there's our, our uh, working directory. All that work for this, well, okay. And again, through the magic of command line recall, I'm gonna try it now on the micro IEC. And it'll know, you'll see the enumerating drives message. He knows what kind of device he's on, so he knows to use CD back arrow. Bada bang, okay. And notice again that he says CMD native, even though it's actually the fat partition on the SD card. But it works, does what it's supposed to do. All right, let's have some fun with LS. Now this is not the fastest program in the world, especially if you have a big directory. The micro IEC, I think there are about 50 files on here. So after he loads it and starts running, reading, 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 and he's reading them all into memory in case he needs to sort them. <coughs> and there it all is. Let's try that on a CMD hard drive. Now, by the way, he's looking at the date fields in the directory, but on the micro IEC, since I don't have a real-time clock, they're all zeros. So he doesn't try and print them. Let's see a directory of the CMD hard drive. We're in a native partition, so we have timestamps, right? Okay, notice he starts by telling us again the device number, the device type, the directory we're in, and there it all is with the timestamps. You know what? I was looking for that one program. Let's sort it. Bring back, sort by name. Now he's got to sort them. He's actually not sorting the directory entries. He's supporting pointers, sorting pointers to all of them. And there we go, nicely sorted by name. Well, what was the last one I worked on? I can't remember. Uh, let's sort them by timestamp. Okay, we go through the sort again. So in a large directory, like here, we have 50 files. It's going to take a second, but it's still very useful. And you can see here by the timestamps, we're getting them in order. Now let's try something a little more exotic. I've got a PowerC projects directory, a projects partition. Let's see, it's partition 27. And there's some files in there for a mouse driver I wrote. Let's see. Device 9. Partition 27, subdirectory mouse. Let's see everything that's in there. CMD syntax, if you don't get it right. Okay, oh, that looks great, okay. Um, actually, let me do it, let me do it on, um, let me do it on the current directory on 9, which is the uh, disk utilities, the, the stuff we're looking at, the source code for the stuff we're looking at. Okay. So you'll see that there's an underscore main for each one, as well as a stub loader. A stub loader. So let's look at all the files for the program I'm showing. There should be four, two source and two compiled. There they are. Now, you can't do this in Commodore DOS. I want to see just the source files. So let's do this, and we'll say ls star.s. And it manually parses to try to keep matching and stop matching and start matching again. And there they are. So all the bells and whistles are there. Any questions about that one? So now I've got the copy command. I got a blank disk in the 1541, and this was really the main reason I was writing these, because I want to be able to back up my source code without exiting the Promal shell and using the Jiffy DOS copier. So let's copy all of the, from source nine, the CMD hard drive, to destination 12, the floppy drive, 
and I'm going to say, actually, let's, uh, for a demo, let me do the uh, mouse files from partition 27. Do you have to put the D in front as well for definition? <laughs> you have You're right, thank you. Okay, copy from source 9 to destination 12, partition 27, subdirectory mouse, every file beginning with mouse, and the destination is just dot. You have to have a destination, so you can just say dot. And it checks correctly for all the stuff like, you know, you can't put wild cards as the destination and stuff like that. So okay, he looked through and he, he, he checked for files that match that pattern and he's starting to copy them. Here's the assembler source, then there's going to be an object file and a documentation file. Now how useful this is to people not using Promol at the command line, I don't know. But it was a lot of fun to write. And that's what this stuff is all about, right? Having fun with your commoner. And there's the second file, which is the object file. And then there's a short documentation file. Now, if I repeat this command, what should happen? Look for everything that matches the pattern. Ah, replace? Yes, no, all, cancel. Let's not do that one. That's the biggest file, right? Let's skip that. So he goes on to the next one. You want to replace that? Yeah, let's do all the rest. So I can say yes, and all the rest of the files get replaced. The object file, and then the little documentation file. Oh, oh, I said yes instead of all. I meant to say all. Oh. Is that a bug? What's 3F? Yeah, I know. So what is 3F though? It shouldn't show an error. 3F is 48 and 15 is 4850, huh? 63 file exists. Yeah. But then why would I get a Q? Oh, you know what? It doesn't clear the uh, it doesn't clear the error at the end. Okay, so we found a bug. It's it's getting the 63 from just before replace file. That's how it knows to show replace file. That's where the 63 came from. Okay. And what I did with, with uh, error handling was I'm returning a word rather than a byte. That's not even the right error code, actually, because what's supposed to happen is that the high byte of the error code tells you whether it's the accumulator error from a kernel call or the status byte at 90 hex or a DOS error like this one. So it should be like zero or 303F or something like that. Oh, well. Now I have something to do for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? I can demo all this stuff at my table if you're interested. Like I said, the source code is there and everything else. Questions about Promol, about the code, about the wonderful utilities, everyone? All right, go forth and code. Have a lot of fun, and thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>